And so I actually use a neti pot every day too oh, yeah. to just rinse out all the, the sinuses. And a big disclaimer for the neti pot, I'm not a paid affiliate of <laughs> neti pot, but I do give them away for Christmas because I think they are, you know, God's gift to singing. <laughs> David Andrew Weeb with the New Music Industry Podcast. I'll get right into what's new this week. Well, I'm doing a lot of learning right now. And a big part of that is just the fact that I'm doing more reading and taking more courses. And as I shared on the blog, a big part of that is just the fact that I identified certain pain points in my business. And as I've talked about before, around the new year, when you've got pain points, you got to be willing to invest. And that's exactly what I've been up to. And overall, I'm approaching summer with a bit of a modified schedule so I can enjoy the season more. After all, it only comes around once a year. I'd rather get out there and enjoy the sun and the great weather than sit inside all day. Although, like I said, I continue to do high impact work and some days I still put quite a bit of work in. It's just a matter of being able to do the things I want to do. And that's a big part of what I now represent in the music business really is kind of lifestyle design. This kind of goes hand in hand with the fact that I'm starting to get my brand and message dialed in. This is an important lesson for anyone listening because I kind of got it backwards. Your brand is really the first thing you want to figure out in your music career or music business, if at all possible. What do you represent? What is your unique selling proposition? And really, what's your purpose for existence? Your why? Once you figure that out, all other decisions kind of become easier. It's like, how do you market something that you don't understand? You can't. You're not going to do a good job of marketing it. You can sort of reach people and maybe get exposure, but is that exposure going to lead to anything? Is it going to lead to profitable decisions? Maybe not. So when you've got your brand and you know your purpose for existing, marketing just becomes so much easier. You can really home in on the message that you want to share. I'm kind of starting to look at myself as the Tim Ferriss of the music industry. I was having a conversation with Brian Young, who did the music for the show, I think it was last summer, and was just talking about the decisions I was making and what I was planning to do. And he said, wow, you're really following this whole four hour work week thing. And I said, well, I'm certainly not following it to the letter, but as far as the lifestyle design part is concerned, absolutely. I want to be able to wake up every day and and design it and be able to do exactly the things I want to do, which is really the life I have right now. I'm sure that's something I'll have the opportunity to touch on more in the future, but I'd like to introduce today's topic. So we're actually going to get into some musicality today, and this isn't something we often discuss on our show. We've certainly had Christopher Sutton from Musical You, one of our favorite human beings, and we should really have him on again to do a catch-up episode, but I wanted to invite one of my friends on for the show and it so happens that he teaches his students how to sing better and he's also the author of one of the most popular posts on my website so why don't we get into that interview and i will meet you in the closing segment well today i'm chatting with founder of ramsey voice studio matt ramsey how are you doing buddy i'm doing good man good to see you again yeah great to see you too you know so just so our listeners know matt has the top performing guest post on our website for 2019 and we also had the opportunity to meet up last august in austin and what a wonderful city that is man i think it might end up becoming one of my many second homes while i'm living the nomadic (laughs) life and looking forward to visiting again this august for for the diy musician conference yeah we love having you oh awesome well i hear what sandra bullock lives there and of course tim ferris everybody Uh yeah (laughs) noah kagan uh jake gyllenhaal uh who's the other one who's the one in the lord of the rings uh oh, oh yeah i can't think I can't of the name, I, but <laughs> yeah i can't believe i forgot this uh yeah. his name uh he lives here <laughs> well i'll maybe google it when i have a moment but okay Matthew yeah. mcconaughey we've, we've got a bunch of them yeah it's it's a fast growing community right it's one of the biggest live music cities in the world right now and it's fast becoming the next silicon valley as well i hear so 
Yeah. So, you know, music instruction isn't exactly a new topic for the podcast. And I taught guitar for over 10 years myself. So I have a frame of reference for what we're going to be talking about today. I even have a chapter in my book, uh, The New Music Industry, about music instruction. So you brand yourself as a vocal coach, not a vocal teacher. What's the difference? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, I brand myself as being able to do both. And, ah. and I personally identify as a singing teacher um, because, um, a, the difference between a singing teacher and a, and a vocal coach is that a singing teacher can actually teach someone that does not yet have the skill set how to sing step by step. So I'll have students all the time that are starting from like, maybe they can't even really sing on pitch or in time just yet. And I'm able to help ferry them from the the very beginner levels to more professional levels whereas a vocal coach traditionally their job is to kind of go in and work with singers that are already uh they already know how to sing they're probably have a big performance coming up and a vocal coach will just kind of go in there and be like okay change this thing or change this line or sing this slightly differently um so it's more of kind of like an effect or a um performance oriented uh, occupation, whereas a singing teacher is a is more, in my opinion, kind of like the the person with the knowledge and skill set to bring someone from A to C or whatever their whatever their uh, destination happens to be. But I do play both roles, and it's kind of funny. Like on my website, I identify as a singing teacher, mm -hmm. but on my YouTube channel, I'm a vocal coach because right. that's what kids know. Uh, and the, it's the kids that are on the YouTube. So kind of talking to different audiences, uh, I won't split hairs, but yeah. yeah, good question. Absolutely. You know, in my business, it's the difference between training and coaching, which at first mm -hmm. sound like exactly the same thing. And how do I even differentiate the two? But training is usually me providing some kind of program on a very specific topic that you want to learn about, such as setting up your website or making your offer that converts or setting up your landing page and stuff like that. And coaching is really where, you know, we're one on one. I'm giving you very specific advice based on your circumstances and what's happening in your career. So I can understand that there's, you know, differentiation that needs to be made there. And, and yeah, yeah. So that's really cool. And like you say, a coach is, is definitely somebody who's guiding you along. I mean, Tiger Woods, Michael Jordan, everybody has a coach, had a coach or as the case might be. And yeah, so that, the importance there, like what, what do you see as being the biggest value of coaching? Yeah, well, I mean, if you look at a lot of those guys, a lot of those guys still have relationships with their coach for their entire career. It's not just kind yeah. of like a you only do this from, you know, ages 11 to 18 or something like that. It's and you'll see that with uh, singing uh, coaching as well. And I'll kind of wrap this into the biggest value is that I think the reason why you see singers like Ariana Grande and Ed Sheeran and like all, all the big names that you can possibly think of, um, they have their vocal coaches with them on tour or certainly in their home city. And they continue to work with them no matter like what level they're at is because a good um, vocal coach and singing teacher, I'll hold them up into one for, for now, is that they keep a singer on the track. And so like very common in a touring setting or in a high performance setting, you'll see people will do kind of one thing one night that'll be a little bit wrong and then see them a month later in this one tiny little wrong thing has like veered so far off course that they're like doing some actual damage to their voice and to their yeah. instrument. Mm -hmm. And the, the purpose of a vocal coach for people of that level is to keep them on that track night after night and consistent and consistently improving that. Yes. Kind of like the shortest distance between any two points is a straight line. And yeah. sometimes we forget that, whether it's in performance or in our music careers, like the things that we got to do to get to where we need to go. We, we get so far off track with uh, shiny new objects or oh, yeah. new, new project ideas or whatever, right? I couldn't agree more. I mean, I have, I have a website with a lot of blogs on it. And <laughs> uh, some of my most trafficked blogs are about... Uh, whistle register and vocal fry mm -hmm. and you know uh all these things that are that i kind of think of as the shiny objects and even though they're interesting and they're important and they get the traffic 90 percent of my time in voice lessons 
is getting students to sing from the bottom to the top part of their voice and back down without any breaks and any strain. And it's like, no. hey, I know you want to talk about whistle register. I know you want to talk about vocal fry. But if you show me that you can do this one thing, this one very basic thing right, then we can talk about those things. But until then, let's keep working on the, the stuff that matters. So the straight line. Back to the basics, right? And yeah, it's like I think it was Bruce Lee that said this. You know, I don't fear the man who's practiced one move ten thousand times. I fear the man who's practiced one move ten thousand times, and that speaks to the importance of the going back to the basics, singing from the diaphragm, etc. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all about the basics. I do a bit of singing myself, and and know that having the wrong technique can tire your voice out and even do damage to it. So. I know you're keeping busy with a lot of clients and working long hours. So how do you make sure that you're taking care of your voice and not overdoing it? <laughs> That's a good question. So for me uh, personally, it has to do with um, actually the same things that I preach to my students. Um, but I have to do them or else my voice falls apart. So for me, every single day, um, I have a, a very strict warm up routine that I do. So I get in the shower, turn on the steam really hot. So I've got some of the, mm. the steam that's actually um, hydrating my vocal cords. I do all my lip trills, uh, all that stuff. Um, I do my gee gee gees, my nay nay nays, na na nas, all that stuff that you can find in my complete singing course. I do that for 30 minutes before I start seeing anybody. And it was actually a big breakthrough that I had was like a few years ago. I was still, I, w I was probably just starting to get really busy and I would still kind of just like wake up, you know, slug around the house and then I'd start, you know, seeing clients for the day, but I wouldn't warm up before. And I noticed that kind of like I was talking about with like the one little thing that goes slightly off. By the end of the day, by the end of like a six or an eight hour day, my voice was screwed. <laughs> like it was totally yeah. hosed. And so I started learning that I really have to do a very strict warm up routine every single day. I also keep a, a really clean diet as much as I mm. can, uh, just really lean protein and vegetables. So cutting out the gluten, cutting out the refined sugar, cutting out alcohol, caffeine, all that stuff. I'm basically the most boring person in the world, but <laughs> it's, it's what it takes to, you know, teach, you know, 30 to 35 hours of students a week. Um, you just have to, you know, ha get rid of all that extra stuff that isn't doing that here in Austin. Allergies are a really big thing. So, um, having a good allergy regimen too is really important because we have a lot of uh, cedar pollen right now. Mm. And so I actually use a neti pot every day too oh, yeah. to just rinse out all the, the sinuses. And a big disclaimer for the neti pot, I'm not a paid affiliate of neti <laughs> pot, but I do give them away for Christmas because I think they are, you know, God's gift to singing. Uh, but just make sure you use distilled water with them and, and you're good to go. So those are the three big things I would say. Yeah, that's really cool. And, you know, I've done some constant experimenting with diet as well as exercise in the last three years or so. Uh, and partly to get into, you know, better shape and better health and to have more energy and all that kind of stuff. And and so, I mean, that's valuable to me in, in a maybe in a slightly different way, just because like I'm always typing something up or jumping on a podcast call like this or designing something and so like end up working long days the more energy i have the better ultimately right so you know when i'm eating at home i'm eating pretty much vegan these days if i'm eating out then i'll i'll kind of let myself eat whatever i feel like in the moment yeah but we like, had some brisket we had some yeah, good we brisket when we were here dude we gotta <laughs> go have some brisket again absolutely and and these days I've been experimenting with uh, intermittent fasting as well, which mm -hmm. uh, which actually has been really great for for losing weight. So yeah, it's almost like the cheat button for losing weight. It seems like yeah, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. You're looking good. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, man. So in your teaching, you say you, you utilize speech level singing and mm -hmm. Institute for Vocal Advancement methods. I'm sure my listeners would love to learn more about that. So talk about these methods. How do they work? Yeah, so kind of the elevator speech for speech level singing is that it was um, devised and designed by Seth Riggs, uh, 
people kind of uh, have different dates when it started, but it certainly became like a big thing uh, during the 80s and during the 90s. It was made famous by singers like Michael Jackson, Stevie Wonder, Bette Midler, Madonna, Anthony Kiedis of the Red Hot Chili Peppers, a bunch Mm -hmm. of others. And they were all students of his. And basically, he took this one really simple idea of hey, most of the time what people are doing in order to hit high notes is exactly why they're not. And that that thing that they're doing is they're straining their voice. So like oftentimes, you know, if people are trying to sing like a high A, they'll, ah! they'll like just really push up to that top note um, when instead it's like, well, wait a second. What if you actually kind of like said that word or brought that word back to speech level? Like, ah, ah awesome or something like that, then you can actually make that note a lot less strained and you can start to build more power into it then. So speech level singing is just all about taking the spoken level or just the way that you would say the words and putting it to music. And that is a surefire way to get rid of the strain because no one has strain when they're talking. I mean, some people have strain, but most people, they're just like, talking, oh, everything's fine. But as soon as they go to sing, they're they're just like have all this tension and stuff going on in their voice. So speech level singing is all about just kind of stripping away all that extra tension and just bringing it back to a very, very healthy and natural place for people. And then if you want to go crazy from there, you can because you actually know where the right place is. You know where the healthy spot is. Um, But as we've seen, Um, there's a lot more kind of like sustainability in ridding the body of the tension um, than there is in just like, oh, I'll just keep doing it. So what if I blew my voice out three times in a row? I'm sure it'll be fine. These (laughs) days it's like we have all these stories about like Adele, Sam Smith, John Legend, great singers that have had big, big vocal issues because they continue to push. Um, And I'm not saying that one singing technique is going to rid the world of all those problems, but it definitely helps make those careers a lot more sustainable. It's so interesting because so many vocalists have like a signature style that is sometimes based entirely on wrong technique, right? Yeah, absolutely. And and so they can go a few years maybe pushing it, but after like touring once or twice, they can't do it anymore and they have to go to a teacher. I mean, even James Hetfield had to do that at one point, right? It was to go learn from a vocal teacher and yeah. Figure out how not to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He does all that, uh, uh, that really grunty stuff. And it was kind of funny because he was bragging in the in the documentary, uh, uh, some kind of monster, I think it's called. Yeah. Where he, he was like bragging about, yeah, I only went to the voice teacher one time, and I've been working with the same CD for ten years now. And I was like, man, and just imagine how much better he'd be <laughs> if he'd actually been using some of those millions of millions upon millions of dollars, if he'd actually used some of those to to work with the vocal coach. But, you know, we love James, man. He sounds awesome. Nope. And uh, the, the point is, is that you just have to make that sustainable. Yeah. It's like you there's no problem with uh, with yelling your guts out every night as long as you're getting back into balance consistently. The thing that uh, drives me nuts, because I mean, the singers that you mentioned are all people that I really enjoy, is, is these days with the, with the millennials who uh, constantly sing with a little mouth, you know, wispy sort of yeah. voice. And uh, I'm like, that's not singing, man. Like, I know it's kind of sounds good to you. And, and I know where you're coming from, because there's so many people since John Mayer that have continually used that sort of voice. Uh, to me, yeah. I've, I'm, I'm now, it drives me nuts now. It's now un- completely unappealing to me. It's everywhere. It, it is. is everywhere it is. <laughs> now. And, it, and, and with Billie Eilish winning all these Grammys too, like when you listen to her music, uh, I love Billie Eilish, but she, it's kind of sounds like a one trick pony after a while because right. it's kind of like everything is sung in that really, really light voice. Um, and I've actually seen some videos of her, uh, she was doing a, a cover of a song by Alicia Keys um, that I just keep falling. Um, I'll think of the the name in a second, but um, she actually sings that with a beautiful, strong mix voice. Billie mm. Eilish does, mm. and that was when she was first starting off. And I think it's really interesting and probably just like a sign of the the changing tastes in music that now everything that she does is super breathy because that has to be a choice now because yeah. I know that she can sing stronger if she wants to. 
Yes, absolutely. That's a really good analysis. And and I'm sorry, I didn't mean to go off in op-ed, op-ed land. I kind of do that, and, and I'm not trying to force an opinion, but that's just... <laughs> <laughs> that's something that that drives me crazy so uh that's okay that's yeah. okay i'm with you awesome so i googled this was it elijah wood that lives out in austin elijah wood yeah yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. he so, lives in austin or lived i don't know people yes. are always coming and going here right <laughs> but we got the name there yeah. we go <laughs> i i keep hoping to run into tim ferris at like whole foods or something but i, I bet if you just keep walking around austin regularly that you'd probably <laughs> run into him at some point well, it's super funny because he actually just put out that he's putting out these challenge videos now from, inspired by his four hour work week book from like 2005. Yeah. But now he's actually doing these challenge videos where he's challenging you to do stuff. But he is going to these restaurants that I used to work at because they have really pretty like kind of design and stuff like that. So he's shooting these videos at restaurants that I worked at like five or seven years ago. And I'm like, dude, if I had just kept waiting tables for another five or seven (laughs) years, I finally could have met Tim, but I had to go and start my own business and be an entrepreneur. And now I (laughs) don't have time to go out and see anybody. (laughs) I hear you. I hear you. I mean, I'm sure you're keeping some pretty intense hours, but the great part is you seem energetic. You seem like you're enjoying what you're doing. And that that's huge. That is massive. Yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah, I absolutely love it. It's kind of a weird thing when you actually find that thing um, that you're really, really passionate about because everybody's like, if you find the thing that you love, you'll never work a day in your life. I, I still find that it's very challenging sometimes, even when you do do something that you love, that there are times when it definitely feels like work, um, but it definitely feels like less work than if you were like, you know, doing something that you didn't like. So, yeah, yeah I think it's all about finding that balance. I hear you. I mean, I do a ton of writing every single day, but sometimes that is a process of banging your head against the wall and letting your soul bleed because <laughs> writing isn't always, uh, you know, what it's what's cracked up to be. And I, actually, honestly, I think a lot that's just typical for a, of a lot of writers is that uh, they either get hooked on Adderall or drugs or alcohol or something else, and and they're off in you know who knows where, but. Fortunately, that's it's never come to that point for me. It's just like one expression of of several talents that uh, sometimes don't always find their expression. Like sometimes I'm writing more, sometimes I'm making more music, and sometimes I'm I'm going out into public and and, and sharing a message, just in public speaking. So, yeah, but it's fun, uh, and that's that's why I do it. Yeah, I'm really big into um, having different creative pursuits right now. So, Mm. um, as I'm sure we're going to talk about in a little bit, like I just launched this singing app. Um, I've got my complete singing course. I've got my YouTube channel. I teach in-person lessons. It's all around this general singing thing, but, um, in, in singing and music is obviously like the fuel and my, and the fire that I have, uh, burning within me, but it it wants to express itself in lots of different ways. So like some days I'll really want to write a blog post about it. Some days I'll really want to shoot a video about it. Some days I'm like, this whole app thing was just kind of like a, a shot in the dark because I was really, um, getting kind of discouraged is a weird word, but I was getting all these emails from, I assume younger people Hmm. um, that were saying like, I have this range from like an E1 to a D8. Uh, What voice type am I? I, Like, am I a bass? Am I a tenor? Am I an alto soprano? Whatever. And they were giving me these, these vocal ranges that were absolutely humanly impossible. Yeah, you can't do that. I mean, like (laughs) you just can't do that. Like you're telling me that you can sing from one end of the keyboard all the way to the other. And, And I don't blame them. I just... I, I'm like, okay, they just got some bad information somewhere or they found an app that, that they figured out how to like, uh, or to, yes, like to, to like squeak out some notes yeah. and they're like, oh, that's my range. And, uh, what I really wanted to create was like an, an app or something automated that would help them find the range with hundred percent accuracy. And it was actually going to tell them how many octaves their range is and what you'll find is that most people's ranges is somewhere between two and two and a half octaves yeah less less if they're if they're not trained and so people talk about like amazing singers ranges like freddie mercury had like six octaves and it's like but not really like you they're just doing the math wrong it's like if you actually look at like from a note to a note to, to make the octaves 
Freddie just had like three and Michael Jackson had three and a six. So mm. it's kind of uh, one of one of those passion projects of mine where I saw an opportunity of like these people don't really understand that. And that's kind of crazy because, um, you know, vocal range and knowing it is really important. It'll tell you like not only how low and how high you can sing, but it'll also tell you what your voice type is like bass, tenor, alto, soprano, all that. It'll tell you where your weak spots are. It'll help you pick songs that fit your voice and stuff like that. So I got really curious about what it would be like to actually go forward and design something that wasn't just a blog post that, you know, a lot of people would click on, but maybe not everybody would actually put into action or watch a YouTube video where they would just watch it. They wouldn't necessarily sing along, but with an app or something like that, they actually have to take some action. And Mm. I was kind of excited about that opportunity. Yeah, it's really cool. And I probably have like a two and a half octave vocal range myself with a lower range being kind of unusable. So I need to keep working on that <laughs> until I until I figure out. I think I just tense up when I go into my lower range, even though it sounds good. It's like it, I, I can't quite project enough to make it usable. So <laughs> that's, yeah, that's the part well, that's, that I'm working at. That's really common too. You know yeah. what that there. So there's kind of like the ex, the the complete vocal range is like as humanly far as I can sing low, as humanly far as I can sing high. Um, but much more, I think, important is what's called your tessitura. And the tessitura yes. is the the measure of your comfortable range. So maybe I can sing from like a B flat 2 up to like a G5, but really only the C3 up to the C5 is comfortable. And so I just went from like two and a half octaves of range to only having two octaves of range in terms of tessitura. And that's way more important. If I'm looking to choose a song, I don't want to choose a song that's like chandelier that it's going to have like three minutes of the songs. I'm going to (laughs) say like it's just staying up there the entire time. Yeah. I need to choose songs that are actually in a better range for me. Yeah. And I think what you've hit on there too is like sometimes you'll see backing singers and bands go on and start a solo career and everybody goes like, I didn't know they could actually sing. And what you discover is they're you're doing exactly what you said, which is they're writing their tessitura, right? They're, mm-hmm. they're making songs in a range that's awesome for them. And, yeah. and making sure that they're actually singing in that range. So yeah. that's, that's how you can, I mean, you're not faking it till you make it, but yeah, that's how you can make it sound really awesome. Yeah. And oftentimes the backup singers are better singers than the front person. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, actually. Yeah. <laughs> there are uh, there are pop singers that I know of whose names won't be mentioned mm. uh, that their backup singers are the ones that are kind of keeping them on course all night. They're like, OK, so they're singing a half step sharp for about the first 60 minutes of the show. Let me see if I can help guide them back into the actual place that they're supposed to be. So it's true. I've heard some of the uh, raw, raw signals coming from some of those vocalists. And yeah, wow. I mean, you can be nervous going on stage or whatever it is. Who knows? But uh uh, yeah, some pop singers don't have the most amazing voices. So you mentioned the Range Finder app and people can go and use that to find their exact vocal range. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. So it's rangefinder.ramseyvoice.com. And I'll even uh, give your listeners a special bonus right now. I want to challenge them to go and try the range app right now. Basically, you just go to rangefinder.ramseyvoice.com. You click uh, one microphone and sing your lowest note. You click the second microphone and sing your highest note. You enter your email and it gives you your range in only six seconds. So like it's three seconds for your lowest note, three seconds for your highest note. That way there's no cheating. People can't just uh, and it count. (laughs) It just won't count it. Um, And then it will tell you your exact vocal range. So uh, the bonus that I'm going to give your listeners is if you go to rangefinder.ramseyvoice.com and you find your range, use the, the little mail app. Um, like the email app that's inside of the app to send me your vocal range and I will tell you what your voice type is. So let's say that you find it from like a C3 to a C5 is your vocal range and I will personally write back to you and be like, hey, you're a tenor, congratulations. Go and live your your whole life as a tenor now. <laughs> um, and again, you can do that in only six seconds. So Nice. Yeah, I think the main thing there is just 
try the test. And if you're new to singing, you probably won't have a massive range, like you said. So don't feel bad, right? You can always right. extend your range by a few notes and and really find your own your own place in, in the whole scheme of things. Because whether it was Johnny Cash with his really low voice or or Bono with his you know borderline tenor voice, there's all kinds of singers out there, and we need all kinds. Yeah, range is, range is just a number, and people get really hung up on that number, and they're like, well, I can sing from here to here, and it becomes this kind of measurement contest, which can, can be kind of fun. I actually built in uh, some social um, mm. shares into the app, so when people find their range, they can share it to Facebook, they can share it to Twitter and be like, hey, I found my range, who can beat me? <laughs> um, but at, at the end of the day, you're right. It's all about how good you can make those notes sound. Yeah. It's not just how low and how high you can go. It's how good it all sounds. And I think that's something that a lot of people forget. Yes, absolutely. And I'm sure the next logical thing that people are going to want to know is how they can extend their vocal range beyond what it is and maybe begin to hit certain notes. Because, I mean... All, we've all had that experience where we've listened to our favorite singers and gone like, Oh my God, I can't hit that note. <laughs> and we want to be able to sing that song, which might just mean adapting the, the key signature, but either way, what, what, what are your thoughts on extending one's range? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, the, the general answer is that you need to work with singing techniques that actually um, help you overcome whatever issue um, you're having. So at the risk of blowing out my microphone here, <laughs> a lot of people may uh, really add a lot of tension as they sing higher. They'll, ah, and that tension is why they can't actually sing up to that, ah, up to that high note, in which case they need to work with singing techniques that, that strip away that tension. And then there are other um, singers out there that their kind of default tendency is that they just back off. They'll, uh, and everything's so light and breathy up there that uh, it's really difficult to get the sound that they want. Mm. And for those singers, they need to work with singing techniques that actually build and strengthen the voice. And to kind of uh, bring it back to the post that I wrote for you, um, which was different ways to sing more powerfully. Yeah. For them, oftentimes it's about working with vowels and exercises that will open up the voice. So if someone's backing off a lot, like, ah, 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 then doing on a ga, 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 can help a lot because that openness of that vowel, that ah, 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 drives hmm. a lot of chest voice, a lot of thickness in the muscles. Um, whereas somebody that's already really tense when they go up to high notes actually working with closer vowels or, or like uh, smaller vowels, like an E or an O, um, starting from high notes can be really helpful. So if I'm, ah, then maybe doing a, or a, can help them get rid of some of that tension. And then they can start to, ah, they can actually start to sing with the, the right balance. Mm. Um, but the um, the capitalist answer is that you just have to check out my complete singing course, yeah, which yes. has, that has <laughs> all these tools and a whole lot more to take you from a beginner to a pro. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. Yeah. Shameless plug. Yeah. By the way, you're using, uh, it looks like it's a road mic. NT1A, NT2A? Exactly. Yeah, the Rode NT1A. I love this thing. Yeah, NT1A is awesome. I used to have one. Actually, I might still have it somewhere in a in a garage stored away. But uh, yeah, what a great mic for the price, right? Definitely. Yeah. yeah. And actually, um, this last, um, about three or four times a year, I do a giveaway um, to my entire email list and to my all my social following and everything where I actually give away... Um, the Shore uh, Solo Studio, um, not Shore, sorry, Focusrite. Sorry mm. about that, Shore. The <laughs> Focusrite Solo Studio, which uh, basically has like all of this stuff. It has like a condenser microphone. It has the uh, audio interface. It's got a mic stand and everything. And I do that because I remember what it was like to not have a lot of money when I was first starting off like with singing and wanting so badly to have one of these precious silver <laughs> mics in front of me and do exactly what you and I are doing right now. Right. 
And I think that that's a, a really cool thing to be able to to give that to somebody, you know. It is good vision, and and I'm sure people appreciate those giveaways. You know, you hinted at this already, but what is like a basic vocal care routine people can follow to make sure they're at the top of their game, especially like touring musicians? Yeah, so for a touring musician, um, depending on the schedule, because th- the thing with tour is that things are changing all the time. You're going from an airplane with recycled air to a hotel room with too high of AC to playing on stage where it's 80, 85 degrees outside Fahrenheit. I don't know what it is in Celsius, sorry. Um, yeah. But you're you're going through all of these environmental changes. So you want to keep control over the things that you can. And the things that I, I hinted at earlier is working with singing techniques that work with your voice. So doing you know your vocal warm-up regimen that uh, that you're doing 30 to 45 minutes a day is great. Um, keeping control over your diet um, and exercise, you could roll that together and making sure that you're um, not adding more inflammation to your body, uh, eating only the things that are going to give you energy and aren't going to drag you down. Um, like we were talking about avoiding all the heavy carbs, the really heavy sugar, the gluten, whatever it is that uh, adds inflammation to your body, um, and keeping up the working out like you were talking about, because, you know, the voice is just one part of a very, very large instrument, which is your body. And if you're keeping everything fit and toned with your own body, then most likely things are working pretty well in your voice as well. And the third thing would be that you want to just, uh, make sure that you're keeping everything, uh, level. You're not going too much into excesses every night. So, uh, that could be drinking too much, uh, smoking too much, could be just, you know, going to a loud bar after the show and screaming your your voice out until it's until it's gone and trying to rehabilitate that the next day is always so much harder than just taking care of everything on the front end. So it's kind of that ounce of pre- prevention is better than a pound of cure Absolutely. kind of idea. <laughs> and and I'll be honest here, um I've worked with some rock stars that they're pretty boring. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> like when they actually talk about their life on tour, it's like, well, yeah, we just got into the hotel and it's like, where are we tonight? Indiana. Okay. Yeah. So we got into the hotel tonight and yeah, I'm just going to, you know, probably watch some TV and, you know, get a good night's sleep. And these guys are playing in front of thousands of people. And it's kind of like, you would never guess that they're like, you know, hanging out in their hotel room and just chilling in order to preserve, you know, all of their energy mm-hmm. for the show and stuff like that and and the long tour that is ahead. So you'd yeah. be surprised at how boring some uh, some rock musicians or just, you know, some high performing people are in general because they know that's what they have to do to to help them preserve their voice. Yeah, I mean, hey, even Tim Ferriss himself has said that uh, at times his life is just as boring, right? He wakes up at a particular time, he meditates for 20 minutes, he drinks a certain cup of tea, he gets to work on and writing his book, and that's kind of like the shape of his day. And people would be like, what? (laughs) I feel like Tim Ferriss is probably more boring than a lot of people realize. (laughs) Yeah, I think it's just like... the, a guy that is that optimized does not leave a lot to chance, you know, no. and the chances are what make life worth living sometimes. So Agreed. I'm all about it. I'm not saying that you have to be a, a monk when you're on tour no, and just, not. I'm sorry, guys, I can't talk. Um, but uh, yeah, there's it's just all things on balance, you know. Yeah, get it dialed in. And if it works, just keep doing what you're doing. So That's right. we're we're going to get into a few fun general questions before we wrap up the episode. The first is, what's the greatest challenge you've encountered to this point that you've overcome? Uh, with singing or with growing a business or... I would love to hear. What would what, you refer to? I would love to hear. Uh, yeah. What was the greatest challenge with growing your business? I would say the biggest challenge to growing my business was figuring out how to write, uh, posts and shoot videos that would actually, Mm. uh, get watched by people. And that was really tough because I know this is probably going to go more into the weeds and you can tell me if it goes too, too technical, but I got some really good advice, um, from a, a good marketing friend of mine who basically said this whole idea of like, Oh, I just need to like write a blog every week, or I just need to shoot a video every week. And I need to do X, Y, and Z uh, things 
uh, all on a really quantity basis, a high quantity. It doesn't matter what it is. Just need to get it out, get it out, get it out. That is not the way to go. Instead, mm-hmm. you want to put out the highest quality, most helpful, give all your secrets away, give away the store, and people will come to trust and respect you. That's a really difficult thing, I think, for a lot of musicians and entrepreneurs to do um, in their business because they're afraid that it's like, oh, if I give away too much or if I make this video too good, nobody will sign up for my course or nobody will read my book or whatever it happens to be. But that's actually the best way to grow an audience that really trusts you. Dude, yeah, absolutely. I really feel your pain there because doing things in business is a lot like learning an instrument or singing because you have breakthroughs as you continue with the process and keep practicing and keep working at it. It doesn't come in a big flash of inspiration. You don't figure it all out overnight. Like I've been studying SEO for years. I kind of got it. Kind, kind of get it, kind of don't get it. And then <laughs> yesterday, yesterday I had a total breakthrough with it. But if I hadn't stayed with the process to kind of figure out exactly what you're saying, creating quality content around a specific subject and also doing it strategically, then, you know, I can't expect to grow my audience. I, I grew my audience to this point, blunt force trauma, exactly what you said, quantity, so much content, this, that, and the other, podcasts, videos, blog posts. And, and I couldn't agree more that like as I look to start new businesses, that really what people want is to hold something beautiful in their hands. Yeah. And you got to give that something beautiful to them. <laughs> this is this is one of my books. I mean, listeners yeah. may not be able to see it. But if I mean, it's not the most incredible design I have. I have I have a book that uh, I think even kind of wins out on this one. But this in my hands still feels like something substantial. It, it looks pretty cool. It's got a cool color scheme. It's got some nice fonts. It's easy to read. And, and that's where the focus I think is, is moving to now, even if it wasn't before. And, and maybe it was always that way, but I, I do feel yes, invest in quality. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and being helpful yes. is one of the other things that, I mean, your book is great. There's a lot of fantastic insights into it. And if it was just pretty book with the, the cool oh. design of a tiger on the front of it, <laughs> but without but without a whole lot of meat on its bones. And I've downloaded a lot of those bad PDFs where it's oh, like yeah. it looks really cool on the outside. You get on the inside and it's just like nothing. It's just like just the, the worst. <laughs> yeah, but it looks really cool. So you downloaded it. So like what impression does that leave with you as a consumer of that content? You're like, OK, well, I can't trust this person. Yeah, but. You know, on the on the contrary, if you get something that even looks maybe a little bit less cool, but is way more helpful, then you've really actually started building a relationship. Yeah, I recently read a 300 page tome by a marketer I shall not name, and he's an excellent communicator. And I've learned a lot from him over the years. But his recent book is just a wandering <laughs> a mess of uh, incoherent babble that uh, there's a few useful ideas as with any book. So I guess that's the point, but uh, I just wish that instead of talking around the subjects, he would talk to the subjects, get to the point, not don't need a lot of writing around it, especially I think there's a, I don't want to assume too much, right? Like if I, when I'm writing something for people, I don't want to assume too much, but I also don't want to talk, spend so much time talking around the point that the people miss it and they can't find yeah. their way back to the start. So, yeah. And that's the importance of having different mediums too, is like, you know, you may have to assume nothing in a blog post, um, or because they can't hear you. Um, in, in my case as a singing teacher, but in a video, it's like, I can just do a, a two second, ah, uh, see, that's like mixed voice. Yeah. And then they get it, you know, whereas like I can write a thousand words on the, on the blog post and maybe some people will get it. Some people won't. Um, so every medium has its own kind of bias as to what's going to work and what's not. It's a great point. And what's the greatest victory you've experienced in your business? Um, the greatest victory was hitting 10,000 email subscribers. Mm, um, huge. Yeah, I just hit that. It was what? Um, February 20th. I think it was, I was, I was like online to being, to doing it by March 1st in sometime in December. I was like, that's it. I've been screwing around long enough. 
I've got 4,500 email subscribers. I'm going to get to 10,000 by, by this date. And so I set that March 1st date and, um, uh, I was able to beat that. And I was, I'm, a, I'm immensely proud of it because, um, I actually really enjoy, um, the relationship that I have with my email subscribers. I know that sounds really weird, but like I get, you know, I send out a weekly email every, you know, week with helpful like singing tips and it's going to be on this and it's going to be on, you know, whistle register and vocal fry and 10 singing techniques to improve your voice. And every week people respond to those and they're like, oh, this was awesome. Or like, oh, I had a question about this. And a lot of people just ask for free lessons, (laughs) which happens too. (laughs) Um, but, uh, I actually really enjoy that. Um, because people think of email as this really cold thing and I actually enjoy getting those emails more than I like looking through my YouTube comment list because YouTube comments can be, uh, they can go several different ways. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Same with Reddit and, and so forth. Oh yeah. There's definitely trolls out there, but I'm just going to say for my listeners, the key is to create, not consume. There's consumers and there's creators. You want to be the creator because the creators guaranteed are the ones making the money. <laughs> it's just how it is. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And are there any books that have helped you on your journey? Uh, absolutely. Um, so many. <laughs> You're going to have to edit out these pauses because I'm having to think. Um, well, I'll tell you one that I'm reading right now that I'm really enjoying. Um, I'm reading, uh, it's called um, The Power of Full Engagement. And that's a really good read. Um, the point is very simple. He gives a ton of different examples. But basically what he's talking about it is how with athleticism naturally built into an athlete's day or ritual or their sport that they play, they have times for recovery. Um, even if it's like 30 seconds after I, like I, I hit a set of tennis and I'm walking back to the start line, there's like 30 seconds of recovery there. But for a lot of business people and especially in our generation now, Everything is on all the time and it just like totally wipes people out and you end up feeling super drained. And so that's something that I, I work with a lot. Um, you know, I just taught three hours of students. I have this, you know, interview right now and now I have another four hours of students in the next five minutes. So it's kind of like trying to find those little bits of recovery time whenever you can. Um, the other big one that I would say is the power of habit. Um, and that's a fantastic read, Charles Duhigg. um, because exactly. Mm-hmm. And that one's so great because it's just all about substituting, finding out what is causing your habit. And most of the time our habits are caused by craving for a specific stimuli and understanding that if that's something that you're trying to fix, you just need to substitute a different stimuli that will achieve that same thing. So as an example, like one thing that I'm always finding myself doing which I shouldn't is like always checking my YouTube channel, always checking the stats and the analytics on how things are growing. And that's because I'm like craving like this feeling of like, Oh, my business is growing or like I need stimulation or I need to feel creative. And so instead substituting that with something else that's a lot more beneficial is, is, has been really game changing for me. Absolutely. I hear you. Staring at those stats doesn't really accomplish much of anything. (laughs) (laughs) It makes you feel, you feel that dopamine release for like just a second. And then you're like, ah, ah, okay, okay. You could, oh, I checked my analytics. Ah. (laughs) And you could check multiple times a day and not much has changed. And, you know, just, and, and I, I depend a lot on organic traffic. So that number can go up, up and down all the time too. And it's nothing to be alarmed or, or fearful of at, at any point. You know, there's so many ways to get traffic these days too. But uh, yeah, you're right. It could be a dopamine release or sometimes it could just be like, oh my God, what's happening with today's organic traffic? <laughs> you know? Yeah, it just took a nosedive and like nothing happened. It's just like the weekend or whatever yeah but your day is ruined because you saw that that thing inch down for a second exactly yeah well this has been a really fun conversation matt thanks for your time and generosity is there anything else i should have asked no those were all great questions i would just say like i i really love it um if i got some emails from your listeners that are like hey i found this range but i have no Mm. idea what my voice type is um, so send me your ranges. Um, you just go to rangefinder.ramseyvoice.com. You click the two microphones, you sing your lowest and your highest notes, 
In only six seconds, you get a 100% vocal range accuracy. And then there's a little mailer thing that you just send it to me at matt at ramseyvoice.com. And I will personally reply with uh, your voice type. And I, I'm super excited to see if uh, some people do it. Absolutely. Sounds good. Send your voice to Matt, everybody. And I will see you, Matt, in Austin again soon, hopefully. Yeah, go get brisket. Oh, yeah. I got to go get brisket again. It was really good. All right, brother. I'll see you. All right. Cheers. And I'm back. Well, this conversation with Matt happened just before lockdown. So even though I wanted to get it out to you much sooner, it was on my other laptop, which was in Abbotsford. I was in Calgary and decided to self-isolate and quarantine there for three months. But I'm glad I'm able to get it out to you now. I am sad that I don't really get to go to Austin this year. I don't think the current circumstances are going to be solved by what the government or the media is proposing. But if I go too far down that track, I know I'm getting into conspiracy theory territory. So I guess I'll leave that one alone. Can you tell I'm itching to travel? I'm really itching to travel. But for all my vocalist friends out there, didn't Matt deliver some superb value here? He didn't have to give away this much. He gave away a lot. He's got a course. He's got students. He's got products. He didn't have to give away as much as he did. And he's got a great guest post, like I said, on Music Entrepreneur HQ. So just please go over, say hi, thank him. Go to his website, find him on social media, whatever it is you do. So here are my three key takeaways from this interview. Of course, as usual, whatever you got out of it is just as important, if not more important. I'm not suggesting that my takeaways are going to be yours. Number one, the top performers in the world work with coaches continuously. You don't just get a coach when you're starting out, when you don't have the money for it. You don't just get a coach in the middle of your career when you're beginning to struggle. And you don't just get a coach towards the end when you're riding high. A coach is someone that you should be working with continuously so that you're at the top of your game. Number two, work on the fundamentals. What's the shortest distance between any two points? A straight line. If you can't identify that straight line, it just goes back to point number one, which is that you need a coach. Takeaway number three, passion isn't always easy. That's something I talk about in my forthcoming book, Flashes of Elation. No, I haven't dropped off the map with that, but I am kind of sorry that it's taken so long. I've got my priorities for this year, and it's already summer. Just unbelievable. I mean, if I'm really lucky, I'm going to finish it at the end of this year, but there's a good chance it's coming next year, 2021. With the news and updates, it's always exciting over at Music Entrepreneur HQ, all the things that we get up to. So there's some things that I forgot to mention in past episodes. It happens. As I alluded to at the beginning, Life Updates June 2020 is now up on the blog, and you can read all about what I've been up to. In a recent episode of the podcast, I was kind of speculating on what I was going to call this, whether it was going to be business report or monthly digest. I settled on life update. That seems to make the most sense. How to get a booking agent went live over at davidandrewweeb.com. And that's also fast becoming an amazing resource for creatives, artists, and of course, musicians. We had a guest post go live on Music Entrepreneur HQ, how to grow your fan base with Instagram and Facebook advertising by Isaiah Ram. A very timely blog post, I would say. The big news, of course, is the program I'm launching. So like last time, I'm going to roll my call to action here. The only way to learn about my new program is to buy the Music Entrepreneur Cord or join my email list. And my new program's going to be amazing. I'm going to have some serious skin in the game in helping you get to the next level in your career. This isn't going to be for everybody. It's going to be for go-getters. It's going to be for people who are at a certain point in their career. If you're way ahead, if you're advanced, then it's probably not going to be for you. But if you're still kind of just getting started, or if you're like at an intermediate level in your career, I think this is going to be a huge help to you. Now you can take your pick in terms of whether to buy the Music Entrepreneur Code or join my email list. I would suggest picking up the book anyway, because it's amazing. It's great. I've had some fantastic reviews and testimonials about it, but you can simply join the email list if that's what you want to do at musicentrepreneurhq.com slash join to start getting links and updates to all the things we're up to. Now we'll get into listener comments. Now, this is a bit of an oldie, but 
why not every once in a while we do like to cover things that have come from the past and still kind of motivate and inspire us today so this one's from the marketing book podcast he says i raise my goblet of rock to you good sir the music industry has changed dramatically and this podcast will help you evolve with the times so that you can pursue your dream of being a musician absolutely it will help you adapt thanks so much the marketing book podcast but wherever you're listening to this right now don't forget leave a rating and review for the show and we will feature it right here on the podcast as usual the fastest and most convenient way to contact me is on twitter my username is at david a weeb that's w-i-e-b-e this is david andrew weeb and i look forward to seeing you on the stages of the world thank you for listening music in this episode was brought to you by brian young wherever you're listening to this right now please consider leaving a five-star review and comment to help us get the word out about the podcast Thank you.